Welcome to the second edition of Sifting Through the Rubble, a webinar of sorts that has as its goal to educate parents as well as interested persons who wish to know uh, what a classical education is and how, how it works for all people and certainly for our children since we have so many things that we have learned both classically and non-classically, uh, it is necessary for us to, as the title of this um, program indicates, to sift through the rubble of what we have been taught and how we have been taught in order to best understand the way to teach and what we wish to teach our children uh, and the children of our church and school and our community. So we, at Sifting Through the Rubble, we're going through our school's pedagogical principles of classical education. Last week, we talked about pedagogy. Pedagogy uh, is the way that we lead children, is the way that we teach children. And last week, we covered festina lente. Festina lente means to make haste slowly. And we discussed why making haste slowly makes a difference in not only life, but also in education. Today, we're going to cover multum non multa, much, not many, and why this principle is so significant, uh, again, for daily life, but certainly for education, and uh, what multum non multa can provide and we help guide even when uh, we sort of acknowledge that it's true, but are trying to grapple with the, the tension. We discussed this tension last week with Festina Lente. There are many things that we need to do, right? Obligations that we have as parents, as people, husband and wife, that our children have uh, as students and as children. And there is a tension between accomplishing those duties uh, and the speed and time at which we try and do them. With multum non multa, there's another tension uh, because there are so many things that demand our attention, that we desire to give our attention to, and yet it is important and helpful for us to distinguish between these many and pay attention to the much. We're going to start, I've got this quote here from Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger is from the, um, the first century AD. He and his uh, uncle, Pliny the Elder, were friendly with um, Vespasian and Titus and Domitian. Uh, they are the Roman emperors uh, from the, the 80s and 90s. Um, and Pliny the Elder wrote a huge natural history. It's many, many, many volumes. Um, Pliny the Younger is known for his letters, and he, he was uh, involved as a governor well into even the time of Trajan in the second century. And um, in the history of Christianity, Pliny comes up because he writes about the Christians to Trajan. But he wrote in a letter, um, the, the broader context is this in English. Perhaps I have more than satisfied your demands. However, there is one thing which I omitted. I have not told you what books I think you should read, though indeed that was implied by my telling you what you should write. Pray remember to select with care the standard authors on a subject. For as the saying is, though we should read much, we should not read many books, since those authors uh, who those authors are is so clearly settled and generally known, I need not point them out to you. Besides, I've already extended this letter to such an immoderate length that I've curtailed it this time by recommending the course of your study. Back then to your writing tablets and either give something from the hints I have now given you or continue the composition on which you are engaged. Farewell. So Pliny says, they say indeed that one should read much, not many books. So we can start with 
books, but then we can take this and, and spread it out to what we should be paying attention to in life. And then certainly as it affects school and how, how we juggle all of the subjects that we think we need to cover without it being many. And indeed, instead, it should be much. So this principle is also said in as many words as quality over quantity, which you've heard before, right? That we want to focus on the quality of a thing instead of how many things we have. There's a fable of the lioness and the fox. And the lioness says at the end, you produce a great many in a litter and often, but you should remember that this one is a lion, right? And so when we're thinking about what we are to do, whether it's the reading of books or the studying of subjects or the accomplishing of goals, should we be focused on many things or on one thing, or at least a lot of one thing instead of many separate things? So when it comes to education, this multum non multa approach is more towards the generalist instead of the specialist side on the one hand, uh, because uh, we want to make sure that children know the breadth and depth of Western civilization. But on the other hand, it can't be every single possible thing that Western civilization contains. That would be to err on the side of many things instead of much. Now, you might say, well, Pastor Paul, you speak, you speak a fine talk and you sell us a, a bag of goods because how many subjects do my children take and how many books do they bring home and how many things do you expect them to cram into a day and into a year? And that's a fine criticism since, there, like I said, there's always the tension, right? We want our children to know math, know how to read, to know history and geography, to know science. We have Latin in there and religion and PE and art and library and the list goes on and on. And so it sounds when you tour our school or when you look at your child's assignment book or you see the email or the learning management system that Memorial Lutheran School is dedicated to many and not to much. But one of the things that we try very intently in doing is to show and live out the interconnectedness of these different subjects. I mean, ideally, it'd be great to boil it all down to four or five things that every student does in one, one grade or another. And to a certain extent, um, our, our goal is really to do that, to work on um, showing parents, students, our teachers, that these things are interconnected, that although we may have nine subjects, really many of those subjects are just a continuation of one thing to the next. One of the ways in which we try and do this, much not many, uh, especially at the upper grades, is to intertwine our history and our literature. So uh, in English class, they are working on books that come from the period in which they're studying in history. That way it isn't juggling nine different things, it's actually just taking the one thing, say the medieval for sixth grade this year, medieval history, and ferreting out each line of that with a different uh, literature book instead of having to juggle so many different balls. Uh, this is true in Latin, that Latin is to be an expansion of grammar and really a deepening of one's understanding of grammar as opposed to say taking two languages. Ideally and ultimately, the study of Latin furthers one's understanding of English grammar and, is, and also furthers one's understanding of history and of literature and of thought and of logic. So uh, it is our goal to interconnect those subjects and to show the interconnection between each of the subjects, um, which is quite the challenge we are very used to discrete entities when it comes to subjects, right? When we were in junior high or in high school, and we still use it for time, right? You had periods. And in this period, you went to that subject. And in this period, you went to that subject. Um, and you're used to, to categorizing. It's a very modern thing 
And when I say modern, I mean late 19th, early 20th century is when that starts. The modern times, uh, things that were discovered during that period would include the gene and the neuron, um, breaking things down into tiny little segments, categorizing everything into its own little box. And it's not to say that doing that, categorizing material is, is a bad thing. Classification is very helpful. Uh, however, when we put things into their own little boxes, the temptation for the modern mind is to wall off the box and not allow the one thing we know to connect to the other thing that we know, right? Our lives are very segmented and, and the world prefers it that way. Uh, look at the dialogue in, in the public sphere. Um, one's, one's religion is not to mix in with one's politics, right? You're supposed to wall those things off in very discreet little boxes. But for Christians, um, that's not really the way it works. Uh, we, we can be Christians in the public square without insisting on a Christian king and laws that come directly from the Bible, right? That's a Lutheran perspective, and we can, we can ferret that out in another session. But that's just one example of desiring and teaching our children and ourselves that knowledge is, is interconnected. Uh, to use the word again, knowledge is universal. It's one big thing that we're learning pieces of, as opposed to many different things that we have to keep inside of our head. So multum non multa, much, not many, You've heard it as less is more, quality over quantity, better versus more, or fewer versus more, or uh, first things first. You may also have, have heard, you know, majoring in minors. This is really majoring in majors, right? Paying attention to the most significant things and knowing them uh, the best. Going deep. Which, which actually allows you to go broad as opposed to just sort of cherry picking in, in survey. And we're very used to surveys and our attention spans prefer surveys, right? We have a half hour for this thing every Friday. And if we went longer than a half hour, all of you would say, well, that's nice, but I have things to do. Um, or you, you just would zone out. You may have even zoned out in the first 13 minutes. Um, because our attention spans are not geared towards much. We're geared towards many, focusing on this for a short amount of time and that for a short amount of time, and maybe both of them at the same time, because we've been convinced that multitasking has some sort of moral supremacy um, over only doing one thing. However, I think that it's very valuable to teach our children like with Festina Lente, to do the one thing well, so we have time to do the other things. If you do multiple things quickly, right, this is the interconnection between Festina Lente and Multum Non Multa. If you do the one thing fast so you can do the other thing fast, then the issue is that you've you probably shot yourself in the foot. You could have focused on the one, completed it, and gone to the next and then completed that. But instead, multitasking and the desire to complete, uh, the desire for instant gratification, which is a problem we have today, certainly um, aided by Amazon and streaming and all of those sorts of uh, modern conveniences, makes it very hard to be convinced that much is better than many. Since we're surrounded by so much many, a scriptural way of looking at this, much not many, is the Mary Martha story in St. Luke chapter 10, where Jesus goes to the house of Mary and Martha, and he is there for a meal, and he is teaching, and Mary sits at his feet, and Martha is busy cleaning, and Martha complains, right, Lord, why? I'm doing all this work, and there, there is Mary. Why can't you tell her to help me? And Jesus says that she is focusing on the one thing needful. 
which will not be taken away from her. We have an excellent Lutheran hymn, 536, I believe it is. One of the things needful, Lord, this treasure um, that, that accentuates that theologically. And then from that theological truth, right, that the one thing needful is the gospel, um, we can order all the other truths. So in a classical Lutheran education, our foundation built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified is the one thing needful. But because we live in the world and God insists on and intends that Christians take care of their neighbors, then after focusing on the one thing needful, which is Jesus, we are to focus on the things that take care of our neighbors, which would be language, math, history and literature, science, the arts, both liberal and fine, um, as well as the sciences in terms of uh, fields of knowledge, not necessarily the natural sciences. So we, as a, as a curriculum, have ordered it that way, that the first end of a education here at Memorial is that children are wise unto salvation, but then they are to be well-spoken. They are to, to have a masterful command of language, to be able to think, to uh, be eager students, all for the purpose of vocation. So we try to focus them on the much, right? on the gospel and education, as opposed to the this, 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 and this, even though there's always that tension between the schedule of this, 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 and this, and the emphasis of much, as opposed to many. The way that much, not many, multum non multa, continues to be helpful is that as a principle, it assists parents, teachers, me as headmaster in always refining what we are doing. Because ideally, multum non multa should lead to fewer subjects. It should lead to longer time spent on fewer things as opposed to you know, short times spent on a lot of things. And that is always a continuous review and process when it comes to preparing the schedule, thinking about the teachers and how their time is spent. Um, and it is something that we review as a faculty that I try to take into account as we apportion out the year. In kindergarten through fifth grade, this is a little easier because the teachers have control over their much, not many since they're in control of the day, right? They control how much time is spent on each subject. They're not really beholden to anyone else in their schedule. Uh, this becomes difficult seventh on up, sixth on up, uh, because we have multiple persons teaching and all of the things that they teach are very valuable, but um, they all believe that theirs is most, and they should. Um, but we can't spend all of our time in one place. There's a, you could boil it down, like I said a little earlier, into at least four if we wanted to boil them down. Math, um, language, where English grammar, spelling, and Latin all combine. Um, literature and great books, which is where you would fit history and all of those things. Um, and then music in the lower school with science in the upper school uh, and, and perhaps logic and rhetoric. Uh, but you can see, right, I couldn't even do four for each because there's so many things you want to do. So again, there's that tension between the things we want to do. We want our kids to know A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and yet the blatant and simple truth that mastering a few things is definitely better in the long run than having 25 minors. Because to know a little bit about a lot of things doesn't get you very far. Uh, when you know a lot about a few things and, again, not the specializing, but the, the way in which those few things interconnect, this then allows that deep 
education to be broad. For example, when I teach Latin, um, from the one Latin lesson, we often will discuss the history of a letter and why in English the pronunciation is such a way. And then we'll also be able to go into some amount of vocabulary just because of derivatives. And then history and literature get pulled into Latin because of say the sentence that we've translated or the vocabulary word that we've covered. And so in the one period, although they're in Latin class, we've gone into all sorts of different uh, branches of knowledge that tie in to the one thing. And it's this emphasis, right, that by going deep, one can then go broad, uh, that permits multum non multa to be such a significant principle with regards to a classical education. Uh, the better one is read in, in a few books as opposed to many, many books, the more one can see the interconnections between, say, that one excellent book and all the things it covers. Um, and then, uh, as opposed to knowing, you know, little tidbits of information. Um, before I open it up for discussion, um, here, as I've said in the first session, I'm entirely beholden to Dr. Christopher Perrin and his work on pedagogical principles. Um, in his notes on this section, he refers to Sarah McKenzie, who's the read aloud revival person. Uh, some of you may know who she is or have listened to her or read her posts. Um, in her book, Teaching from Rest, she gives practical strategies uh, with regards to multum non multa, and I wanna read those. I don't have it available up, uh, otherwise I throw it on the screen. So for multum non multa, you want to clarify your vision, right? And that's what multum non multa does, is it clarifies what you're trying to accomplish. Um, one should begin with a time budget so you can budget the time to study the most important things. This of course is best for homeschooling uh, since that's sort of who she speaks to, but it also is good from a parental standpoint and a sort of educational planning the year standpoint. You make trade-offs intentionally. Instead of just saying, oh, we don't have time for that, you plan accordingly to make sure that what you're trading off, uh, you're able to cover later. Um, read aloud more often. This is a good use of time. Our teachers are more dedicated to this uh, and have continued to do so. You've seen our blog posts, hopefully, that have been a lot uh, They've been very much focused on reading out loud, on the benefit of reading stories. And even in this, right, by reading out loud, you're able to access all of the things inside one of these books. And that's, the, that's why good books are very helpful, because usually a good book will give you a broad access to information, to um, allusions, to different stories, to vocabulary, to beauty, to truth, and you can follow it in any number of different rabbit holes. Um, it's good to pair back within your subjects, right? Choose core texts, fewer books that you can know better. Our teachers um, have a lot of books they want to cover in a year, say in literature, but it's better instead of having trophies, right? I finished this book and that book and this book, um, to know the five or six books in 30 plus weeks really well instead of 11 or 12. And again, that provides attention because you want to get through things. You don't want to um, slow down necessarily. There's things you want to teach, but you also want to give the author his due, the text his due. Um, as we approach this, her, her next one is don't get hung up on finding the best because that can become its own distraction, which is true. If, if we're always looking for something, right, and not finding any contentment, then um, we'll never actually get to settle down. There's always more to learn. I learn new things all the time, and I learn how to better my craft every year. So if you're convinced that such and such a book is good to read to your children right now, or we're convinced in the curriculum this is the book we're going to use to teach such and such a subject, we should be content with it right now. And then at some point, maybe we will find something better. 
but we won't sort of restlessly look for it. it it's just an unhelpful uh, way of doing things. Uh, and then lastly, we go to one more verse and that's Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. That verse, Philippians 4, 8, can serve as sort of our guide for what fits in the multum known multa. It ought to be lovely and true, beautiful, noble, um, excellent and praiseworthy, right uh, and pure. So that foundation we build chiefly on, on Christian doctrine and the scriptures then serves as a guide for us to choose our books for literature, our subjects for, the, uh, for science and history, etc. So that is um, some meanderings on multum non multa, on much, not many, how to focus on the quality of one's education as opposed to the quantity of such. What I'm gonna do with the few minutes we have remaining is allow you to unmute yourself if you wish. Please don't all do it at once because it can get kind of cacophonous. But if you'd like to um, say something or ask a question or, um, bring something to the conversation for the last few minutes, I'd be more than happy to have you join. I'm gonna stop the share now too. Anybody? Nobody? You don't have to be shy. I mean, you can be if you wish. Elizabeth. No, Claire's just waiting. <laughs> Clara, you have something to add? Say so we love the Sarah McKenzie and we highly recommend her. Yes. Yeah, Sarah McKenzie's very good. Um, I, I hope that this will be a way for a lot of our families to access. Uh, classical academic press is really great. Uh, I like a lot of what they do. They're not Lutheran. Oh, there's some chats. Good. Um, but they, they are doing some really good things. Okay. You should be able to now. Sorry, Chris. Um, there you go. Uh, classical academic press is worth your time. Uh, they're very, they've been very active in the revival for classical education. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just going to say that the verse from Philippians, I think, highlights one of the ways that Memorial Lutheran can really differentiate itself, uh, namely that, you know, what's missing in our public schools is this, uh, this idea that truth and beauty is something that can be, uh, can be taught and can be known, and it is not totally relative. Mm -hmm. um, and so... You know, I think people these days are so scared to even take a step in that direction, but that when someone can sort of realize that you don't have to be afraid of it, and we can, you know, we can start pointing to it, it becomes very attractive to people, even those who aren't really aware of exactly what it is they're seeking um, and can't call it by name. So um, I, I think a lot of this framework that you've laid out here, it, it's exciting. It's um, it's it's good for the children. It's definitely pleasing for the parents to see that that you know we're going to be doing spelling and writing and some of the rudimentary things uh, with a, with that spirit, right? I also love this whole idea of there is beauty in repetition, routine, and monotony, and um, and uh, I think we can fall into that a lot and just sort of look at that as a negative. But if you choose to see the, uh, the, the positive side of it, um, I, think, I think it's great. So, and appreciate you also sharing this and getting, getting the parents involved in this way as opposed to sort of making it your little secret sauce. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best part about the secret sauce is that the recipe is available, right? Yeah. Uh, this, this is... Um, sort of part and parcel to the flourishing of humanity um, 
in the midst of adversity and suffering, uh, which is how the Christian life is. Right? God lets the rain fall on the just and on the unjust. He has given us great and marvelous gifts with which to love our neighbors. Uh, at the same time, the world, our flesh, and the devil are trying to attack us and to convince us that this is not worth it, that there are easier things you can do in life, uh, and yet we are supposed to strive for the true, the good, and the beautiful, the noble, and the praiseworthy. That's what we are to think of as Christians and to hand those things over to our children. Uh, before we go, a, a heavy hitter book this time. Uh, if, if philosophy gives you headaches, don't read this. Ask me about it later. But Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver. It is from 1948, and it is outstanding. It is so good. Uh, what he sees and saw, he died in his 50s in, in the early 60s. He taught rhetoric at the University of Chicago. Um, the way in which he sort of analyzes and identifies what culture was doing in the early 20th century and as the result of the Second World War, it's very prophetic in, in terms of uh, his analysis and his description. Again, it's a little heavy. Uh, it will prop, it, if heavy stuff puts you to sleep, this is, this is a nap inducer. But if you like to read thoughtful philosophical things, um, it is definitely worth your time. I've really enjoyed working through it. Um, Ideas Have Consequences by Richard Weaver. So with that being said, we've come to the balance of our time. I appreciate all the comments. It is a joy uh, to do this on a Friday. Next week, we will be in person uh, with Coffee with the Headmaster. We'll be in the Fellowship Hall here at church so we can spread out and have plenty of room with regards to distancing. Uh, we'll let you in over at the, the school office side. Um, and we gather between 745 and 8. And then um, at 8, I do the announcements for the school. And then I come in and then we'll go through the article. The article is Filling Leaky Vessels by Martin Cothran. You can find that on the internet by typing that in. But it's also in our newsletter this week. Uh, in terms of accessing that article. Uh, feel free to join us and come uh, for Coffee with the Headmaster. And then the following week on the 11th, we'll pick back up with, with uh, sifting through the rubble, moving on to By Teaching We Learn, to Kendo Discimus as the third principle of, of pedagogy for a classical Lutheran school. I thank you all for coming. It's a great uh, turnout. Hope you appreciated it. It'll be up on YouTube at some point soon for our uh, wider audience. Subscribe to our channel, Memorial Lutheran Schools channel on YouTube. Uh, we can use all the support we, uh, you are showing right now uh, publicly and privately. So thanks again for coming to Sifting Through the Rubble. Have a lovely Friday and a blessed weekend, and we shall see you when we see you.